The Case for Christ. Chapter 5. Scientific Evidence. Does archaeology confirm or contradict Jesus' biographies? There was something surreal about my lunch with Dr. Jeffrey McDonald. There he was, usually munching. There he was, casually munching on a tuna salad sandwich and potato chips in the conference room of the North Carolina courtroom, making upbeat comments and generally enjoying himself. In a nearby room, a dozen jurors were taking a break after hearing gruesome evidence that McDonald had brutally murdered his wife and two young daughters. As we were finishing our meal, I couldn't restrain myself from asking McDonald the obvious question, how can you act as if nothing is wrong? I said, my voice mixed with astonishment and indignation. Aren't you a, the, slight bit, the slightest bit concerned that those jurors are going to find you guilty? McDonald casually waved his happy sandwich in a general direction of the jury room. Them he courted, They're, they'll never convict me. Then, apparently, realizing how cynical those words sounded, he quickly added, I'm innocent, you know. That was the last time I ever heard him laugh. Within days, the former Green Beret and emergency room physician was found guilty of stabbing to death his wife, Colette, and his daughters, Kimberly, age five, and Kristen, age two. He was promptly sentenced to life in prison and carted off in handcuffs. McDonald, whose story was masterfully recounted by Joe McGinnis in the bestseller and TV movie Fatal Vision, was Cockly, cocky enough to think that his alibi would help him get away with murder. He had told investigators that he was asleep on the couch when drug-crazed hippies awakened him in the middle of the night. He said he fought them off getting stabbed and kicked and knocked unconscious in the process. <laughs> When he awakened, he found his family slaughtered. Detectives were skeptical from the start. The living room showed few signs of life and death struggle. McDonald's wounds were superficial, though he had poor eyesight. He was somehow able to provide detailed description of his attackers, even though he had not seen, even though he had not been wearing his glasses. <clears throat> However, skepticism alone wasn't however, skepticism alone didn't win conviction. That requires hard evidence. In McDonald's case, detectives relied on scientific proof of untangible to, untang to untangle his web of lies and convict him of the slayings. There is a wide variety of scientific evidence that commonly used in trials ranging from DNA typing to forensic anthropology to toxology. In McDonald's case, it was serial blood evidence and trace evidence that dispatched him to the penitentiary. In an extraordinary and for prosecutors, fortuitous coincidence Coincide with each coincide each member of J McDonald's family has a different blood type. By analyzing where blood stains were found, investigators were able to reconstruct the sequence of events and deadly that deadly evening. And it directly contradicted McDonald's version of what happened. Scientific study of tiny blue pajama threads which were found scattered in various locations were refuted his alibi and microscopic analysis demonstrated that holes in his pajamas 
had not could not have been made as he claimed by an ice pick yielded by the home invaders. In short, it was FBI techniques and technicians in white lab coats who were really behind McDonald's conviction. Scientific evidence can also make important contribution to questions of whether the New Testament accounts of Jesus are accurate. While theology and textology aren't able to shed any light on the issue, another category of scientific proof, the discipline of archaeology, has great bearing on the reliability of the Gospels. Sometimes called the study of durable rubbish, archaeology involves the uncovering of artifacts, architecture, art, coins, monuments, documents, and other remains of ancient cultures. Experts study these relics to learn what life was like in the days when Jesus walked the dusty roads of ancient Palestine. Hundreds of archaeology, archaeological findings from the first century have been unearthed. As I was curious, did they undermine or undergird the eyewitness stories about Jesus? At the same time, my curiosity was tempted by skepticism. I have heard too many Christians make exorbitant claims that archaeology can prove a lot more than it really can. It wasn't interested, I wasn't interested in more of the same. So I went on a quest for a recognized authority who was personally dug among, who has personally dug among the ruins of the Middle East, who was, who has an encyclopedic knowledge of ancient findings and who poses enough scientific restraint to acknowledge the limits of archaeology while at the same time explaining how it can illuminate life in the first century. The fourth interview, John Ray, John McRae, Ph.D. When scholars and students study archaeology, many turn to John McRae's through the dispassionate 432-page textbook, Archaeology and the New Testament. When the Arts and Entertainment Television Network wanted to ensure the accuracy of its Mysteries of the Bible program, they called McRae as well. And when National Geographic needed scientists who could explain the intricacies of the biblical world, Again, the phone rang in McRae's office at a well-respected Wheaton College in suburb Chicago. Having studied at Hebrew University, the Ecole Biblique, Biblique at Archaeologue Francis in Jerusalem, Vanderbilt University Divinity School, in the University of Chicago, where he earned his doctrine in 1967, McRae was a professor of New Testament and archaeology at Wheaton for more than 15 years. His articles have appeared in 17 encyclopedias and dictionaries. His research has been featured in the Bulletin of the Near East Archaeology Society and other academic journals. And he has presented 29 scholar papers at professional societies. McRae is also a former research associate and trustee of W.F. Albright Institute of Archaeology Research in Jerusalem, a former <coughs> trustee of the American Schools of or Oriental Research, a trustee of the Near East Archaeological Society, and a member of the editorial board 
of Archaeology in the Biblical World and the Bulletin uh, for Biblical Research, which is published by the Institute of Biblical Research. As much as McRae enjoys writing and teaching about the ancient world, he relishes opportunities to personally explore the archaeological digs. He supervises excavating terms at Sisera, Sephoris, and Herodim, all in Israel. Over an eight-year period, he has studied Roman archaeological sites in England and Wales, analyzed digs in Greece, and traced much of the Apostle Paul's journeys. At age 66, McRae's hair is turning silvery and his glasses have become thicker. He is still exudes an air of adventure over the desk in his office and in fact also over his bed at home. It is detailed a horizontal photograph of Jerusalem. I live in the shadow of it, he remarked, a sense of longing in his voice as he pointed out specific locations of excavation and significant findings. His office features the kind of cozy couch you'd find in the front porch of a country home. <coughs> I settled into it while McRae casually dressed in an open-necked shirt and a sport jacket that looked comfortable, comfortably worn, leaned back in his desk chair. Seeking to test whether we would overstate the influence of archaeology, I decided to open our interview by asking him what it can tell us about reliability of the New Testament. After all, as McRae notes in his textbook, even if archaeology can establish that the cities of Medina and Mecca existed in Western Arabia during the 6th and 7th century. That doesn't prove that Muhammad lived there and, or that the Quran is true. Archaeology has made some important contribution, he began, speaking in a doll he picked up to a ch as a child in southern southeastern Oklahoma, but it certainly can't prove whether the New Testament is the Word of God. If we dig in Israel and find ancient sites that are consistent with where the Bible said we'd find them, that shows that his history and geography are accurate. However, it doesn't confirm that Jesus Christ said is right. Spiritual truths cannot be proved or disproved by archaeological discoveries. As an analogy, he offered a story of Henrik Schleiman, who searched for Troy in an effort to prove the historical accuracy of Homer's Helid. He did find Troy, McRoy observed with a great gentle smile, but what didn't prove the Elid was true. It was merely accurate in the particular geographical reference. Once we had set some boundaries for what archaeology can't establish, I was anxious to begin exploring what it can tell us about the New Testament. I decided to launch into this topic by making an observation that grew out of my experience as an investigative, investigative journalist with a legal background. Digging for the truth. In trying to determine if a witness is being truthful, journalists and lawyers will test all the elements of his or her testimony that can be tested. If this investigation reveals that the person was wrong or was wrong in those, those details, this casts considerable doubt on the vicinity of his or her entire story. Whether, however, if the miniature check 
this is some indication, not in conclusive proof, but some evidence that maybe the witness is being reliable in his or her overall account. For instance, if a man were telling about a trip he took from St. Louis to Chicago, and he mentioned that he had stopped at St. Springfield, Illinois, to see a movie, Titanic, at the Odeon Theater, and that he had eaten a large Clark bar he bought at the Pensation counter. Investigators could determine whether such a theater existed, exists in Springfield as well as if that, as well as if it was showing this particular film and selling this specific brand and size of candy bar at the time he said he was there. If their findings contradict what the person claimed, this curiously tarnished, this seriously tarnishes his trustworthiness. If the details check out, this doesn't prove that this entire story is true, but it does enhance his reputation for being accurate. In a sense, this is what archaeology accomplishes. The premise is that if, if, is that if an ancient historian's incidental details check out to be accurate time after time, this increases our confidence in other material that the historian wrote about that cannot be readily cross-checked. So I asked, uh, so I asked McRae for his professional question, opinion. Does archaeology affirm or undermine the New Testament when it checks out the details on these accounts? McRae was quick to answer. Oh, there's no question that the credibility of the New Testament is enhanced, he said. Just as the credibility of any ancient document is enhanced when you excavate and find that the author was accurate in telling about the particular place or event. As an example, he brought up his own digs in Sisera on the coast of Israel, where he and other others excavated the harbor of Herod the Great. For a long time, people questioned the validity of the statement by Josephus, the first century historian, that this harbor was uh, as large as one at Piraeus, which is a major harbor in Athens. People thought that Josephus was wrong because when you see the stones above the surface of the water in the contemporary harbor, it no, it's not very big. But when you begin to do underwater excavation, we found that the harbor extended far out into the water underground, that it had fallen down, and that its total dimensions are indeed comparable to the harbor of Paresis. So it turns out Jophysis was right after all. This was one more bit of evidence that Josephus knew what he was talking about. So what about the New Testament writers? Did they really know what they were talking about? I wanted to put this issue to rest in I wanted to put this issue to test in the next line of questioning. Luke's accuracy as a historian. The physician and historian Luke authored both the gospel bearing his name and the book of Acts which together constitute about one quarter of the entire New Testament. Consequently, a critical issue is whether Luke was historian, a historian who could be trusted to get things right. When archaeologists check out the details of what he wrote, I said, do they find that he was careful or sloppy? The general constants of both literature, the both 
the general consensus of both liberal and conservative scholars is that Luke is very accurate as a historian, McRae replied. He's in Edirite. He's eloquent. His Greek approaches classical quality. He writes as an educated man, and archaeologically discoveries are showing over and over again that Luke is accurate in what he has to say. In fact, he added, there have been several instances similar to the story about the harbor in which scholars initially thought Luke was wrong in a particular reference, only to have later discovers, discoveries confirm that he was correct in what he wrote. For instance, in Luke 3, 1, he refers to Lysanias being the tyrant Tetric of Abilene in about AD 27. For years, scholars pointed to this as evidence that Luke didn't know what he was talking about, since everybody knows that Lysanias was not a Tetric, but rather a ruler of Chalcis half a century earlier. If Luke can't get that basic fact right, they suggested, nothing he has written can be trusted. That's when archaeology stepped in. An inscription was later found from the time of Tiberius, from A.D. 14 to 37, which names Lysinus as Tetra in Albia near Damascus. Just as Luke had written, McRae exclaimed, it turned out there had been two government officials named Lysinus. Once more, Luke was shown to be exactly right. Another example is Luke, and Luke's reference in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, to Polit to Politar Arts, which is translated as city officials by the NIV in the city of Thessalonia. From a, for a long time, people thought Luke was mistaken because no evidence of t the term Politarchs had been formed in any ancient Roman documents, the Gray said. However, an inscription on the first century arc was later found that begins in the time of the Politarchs. Politarchs. You can go to the British Museum and see it for yourself. And then, lo and behold, archaeologists have found more than 35 inscriptions that mention Politarchs. Several of those in Thessalonia from the per same period Luke was referring to. Once again, the critics were wrong and Luke was shown to be right. An objective popped into my mind. Yes, but if but in his gospel, Luke says that Jesus was walking into Jericho where he healed the blind man, Bartimaeus, while Mark says he was coming out of Jericho. Isn't this clear-cut contradiction that cast doubt on the, the, on the reliability of the New Testament? McRae wasn't stung by the directness of my question. Not at all, came his response. It only appears to be contradiction because you're thinking in contemporary terms in which sites are built and Day put, but that wasn't necessarily the case long ago. Jericho was in at least four different locations, as much as a quarter of a mile apart of ancient times. The city was destroyed and resettled near another water supply, or a new road, or nearby mountain, or 
whatever. The point is, you can be coming out of one site where Jericho existed and be going into another one, like moving from one part of a suburb of Chicago to another part of the suburb of Chicago. What you're saying is that both Luke and Mark could be right, I asked. That's correct. Jesus could have been going out of one area of Jericho and entering at the same time and into another at the same time. Again, archaeology had answered another challenge in to Luke and given the large proportion of the New Testament written by him, it's extremely significant that Luke has been established to be scrupulously accurate historian, even in the smallest details. One prominent archaeologist carefully examined Luke's references to 32 countries, 54 cities, and 9 islands, finding not a single mistake. There's Here's the bottom line. If Luke has, if Luke was so painstakingly accurate in his historical reporting, said one book on the topic, on what logic basis may we assume he was credulous or inaccurate in his reporting of matters that were far more important, not only to him but to others as well. Matters, for example, like the resurrection of Jesus, the most influential evidence of his deity, which Luke says was firmly established by many convincing groups. Acts chapter 1, verse 3. Reliability of John and Mark. Archaeology may support the credibility of Luke, but he isn't the only author in the New Testament. I wondered what scientists would have to say about John, whose gospel was sometimes considered suspect because he talked about locations that couldn't be verified. Some scholars charge that since he failed to get these basic details straight, John must have must not have been close to the events of Jesus' life. That conclusion, however, has been turned upside down in recent years. There have been several discoveries that have shown John to be very accurate, McRae pointed out. For example, John chapter 5 verses 1 through 15 records how Jesus healed an invalid in the pool of Basidia. John provides the detail that the pool was had five porticos. For a long time, people cited this as an example of John being inaccurate because no such place had been found. But more recently, the pool of Basidia has been excavated. It lies maybe 40 feet below ground, and sure enough, there were five porticos, which means colonnade porches or walkways, exactly as John had described. And you have other discoveries. The pool of Siloam from John chapter 9 verse 7. Jacob's well from John chapter 4 verse 12. The probable location of the stone pavement near the Jaffa gate where Jesus appeared before Pilate in John chapter 19, verse 13. Even Pilate's own identity, all of which have lent historically credi credible credibility to John's gospel. So this challenges the allegations that the gospel of John was written so long after Jesus that it can't possibly be accurate, I said. Most definitely, he replied. In fact, McRae inter iterated what Dr. Bruce 
Metzger had told me about archaeologists finding a fragment of a copy of John 18 that leading pathologists have dated to about AD 125. By demonstrating that copy of John exists, existed this early and as far away from Egypt as Egypt, archaeologists have efficiently dismantled speculation that John had been composed well into the second century, too long after Jesus' life to be reliable. Other scholars have attacked the Gospel of Mark, generally considered the first account of Jesus' life to be written. Atheist Michael Martin accused Mark of being ignorant about Palestinian geographic, which he says demonstrates that he could not have lived in a region at the time of Jesus, especially if he cites Mark 7, chapter 7, verse 31. When Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sodom, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis, it has been pointed out as said Martin, that given these directions, Jesus would have been traveling directly away from the Sea of Galilee. When I posed Martin's critic to McRae, he furrowed his brow and, brow and then went into a fury of activity, pulling a Greek version of Mark off his shelf grabbing reference books and unfolding large maps of ancient Palestine. What these critics seem to be assuming is that Jesus is getting in a car and zipping around in, on the interstate. But he obviously wasn't, he said. Reading the text in the original language, taking into account the mountainous terrain and pauperal roads of the region, and considering the loose ways Decapolis was used to refer to a confederation of ten cities that varied from time to time. McRae traced a logical route to the map that corresponded precisely with Mark's description. When everything is put into the appropriate context, he concluded, there is no problem with Mark's account. Again, archaeological sites had helped explain what happened at first to be sticking points in the New Testament. I asked McRae a broad question about that. Had he ever encountered an archaeological finding that blatantly contravened the New Testament reference. He shook his head. Archaeologically has not produced anything that is an equivalently a contradiction to the Bible. He replied with confidence. On the contrary, as we've seen, there have been many opinions of skeptical scholars that have become codified into fact over the years, but that archaeology has shown to be wrong. Still, there were some matters I needed to resolve. I pulled out my notes and got ready to challenge McRae with three long-standing riddles that I thought archaeology might have some trouble explaining. Puzzle 1. The Census the birth narrative of Jesus claim that Mary and Joseph were required by a census to return to Joseph's hometown in Bethlehem. Let me be blunt. This seems absurd on the fact that on the, on the fact face of it. How could the governor government possibly force all its citizens to return to their birthplace? 
is there any archaeological evidence whatsoever that this kind of census ever took place? McRae calmly pulled out a copy of his book. Actually, the discovery of ancient census forms have shed quite a bit of light on this practice, he said as he leafed through the pages. Finding the reference he was searching for, he quoted from an official governmental order dated A.D. 104. Gaius Vibus Maximus, prefect of Egypt, says, Seeing that the time has come for the house-to-house -house census, it is necessary to compel all those who have, all those who who, for any cause whatsoever, are residing out of their province to return to their own homes, that they may both carry out the regular orders of the census and may also attend diligently to the cultivation of their allotments. As you can see, he said as he closed the book. This practice is confirmed by this document, even though this particular manner of counting people might seem odd to you and other papyrus. This one from AD 48 indicates that the entire family was involved in the census. What's more, scholars have pointed out that to avoid inflaming the population, Romans were known to sometimes let a census be taken on the basis of local customs. In the Jewish culture, this would mean that Mary and Joseph would need to register in their ancestral home. This, however, did not entirely dispose of the issue. Luke said the census was that brought Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem was conducted when Quintarinus was governing Syria and during the reign of Herod the Great. That poses a significant problem, I point out, because Herod died in 4 BC and Quintarinus didn't begin ruling Syria until AD 6. Con Conducting the census soon after that, there's a big gap there. How can we deal with such a major discrepancy in this in the dates? The gray knew I was rising an issue that scholars have wrestled with for years. He responded by telling me about a recent report by an archaeologist that had found very small writings in micrographic letters on coins that showed Quintarius as a ruler in Syria and Sicily from 11 BC and until after Herod's death. This would mean that there were two different officials named Quintarius and the census would have taken place under the earlier one during the reign of Herod. This sounded a bit speculative to me, speculative to me, but rather than bog down the conversation, I decided to mentally file this issue away for a later analysis. As it turned out, the archaeologist referenced to McRae died shortly after McRae and I spoke. He had never written any peer review articles on his finding, and nobody has replicated his discovery. In the end, experts dismissed this claim. When I did some actual, when I did some additional research, I found that Sir William Ramsey, the late archaeologist and professor at both Oxford and Cambridge Universities in England, believed that Quarantius was a ruler in Syria on two separate occasions, which would carry the time period of an entire century. 
which Ramsey dated around 87 BC. However, this earlier consensus, however, this earlier census is not mentioned anywhere in the historical record. Still, this would not be surprising if there had been no disturbance that warned the attention of Delphesis or other ancient historians. Questions have also been raised about the idea that the Romans would have ordered a census in Syria when it wasn't fully enfolded into the Roman Empire. But there is presented but there is presented from Roman from Rome ordering census in client states. Harold W. Horner, who earned his doctrine at Cambridge, pointed out that Herod was ill and came into conflict with the Roman Empire Augustus in 87 BC. With such instability and such bad state of health, it would have been an opportunity, an opportune time for Augustus to have had a census taken in order to assess the situation before Herod's death, he said. Therefore, a census within the last year or two of Herod's reign would have been reasonable and, in fact, most probable. Said New Testament professor Daryl L. Bach, A census in Herod's time requiring a journey by Joseph and Mary is a possibility based upon what he knew what do we know of Roman practice? That no other source mentions such a census is not a significant problem, since many ancient sources refer to events that are not collaborated elsewhere, and since Luke is found to be trustworthy in his handling of facts that one can check, since the details of the census fit into general Roman tax policies, there is no need to question that it could have occurred in the time of Herod. But what about Luke's claim concerning Quintarius? Some scholars have pointed out that Luke's text could be translated. The census took place before Quintarius was governor of Syria, which would resolve the problem, said Ho, ho near. This gives a good sense of passage at hand, although some scholars have disagreed with the rendering. Other possibilities have been discussed. The situation, the solution to the Quarantinus problem is valid. Let me start that again. Other possibilities have been discussed. The solution to the Quintarius problems are varied, Bach said. No candidate is so manifestly superior that it can be regarded as a solution. That one faces it a ver that one faces is a variety of solutions, many of which could be correct. But one other fact seemed especially persuasive to me. Luke could not have been referring ref, could not have been referencing the AD six census because this would mean he would be contradicting himself. How Honer points out that Luke was well aware of the AD six census, which he refers to in Acts chapter five verse thirty seven. But Luke was also aware that Jesus could not have been born that late, since he and Matthew concur the birth occurred around under Herod's see Luke chapter one verse five and Matthew chapter two verse one. Further, Luke said Jesus 
was about 30 years old when he started his ministry, Luke chapter 3, verse 23. This would have been shortly after the start of John the Baptist's ministry, which Luke stated around A.D. 27 to A.D. 29. See Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. The implication is clear. If the census had been in A.D. 6, Jesus would only have been 21 or 23 years old when he started his ministry. But Luke knew he was older than that. Therefore, said Honer, Luke could not have been referring to the A.D. 6 census when he wrote about Jesus' birth. Certainly, he said, Luke was conscious of chronological in his works. That made sense to me. Luke was an astute historian who would not have made such a fundamental error of contradicting himself. There must have been an earlier census that prompts the journey for of Joseph and Mary, a census that would have occurred during the reign of Herod, as Luke report, reported. After assessing the various scenarios, Bach it is clear that the regulations of the census account in Luke to the category of historical error is premature and erroneous. Puzzle 2. Existence of Nazareth. Many Christians are unaware that skeptics have been asserting for a long time that Nazareth never existed during the time when the New Testament says Jesus spent his childhood there. In an, ancient, in an article called Where Jesus Never Walked, atheist Frank Zendler wrote that Nazareth was not mentioned in the Old Testament by the Apostle Paul, by the Talmud, although 63 other Galatian towns are cited, or by Josephus, who lived 45 years who listed 45 other villages and cities of Galilee, including Jaffa, which was located just over a mile from present Nazareth. No ancient historians or geographers mentioned Nazareth before the beginning of the 4th century. The name first appeared in the Jewish literature in a poem wrote about the 7th century A.D., this absence of evidence paints a suspicious picture. So I put the issue directly to McRae. Is there any archaeological confirmation that Nazareth was in existence during the first century? That issue wasn't new to McRae. Dr. James Strange of the University of South Florida is an expert on um, this area, and he describes Nazareth as being a very small place, about 60 acres, with a maximum population of about 480 at the beginning of the first century. In 1962, an archaeologist report the discovery of a list of Americ, a list in Americ describing the 24 courses or families of priests who are relocated after the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in AD 70. One course was moved to Nazareth, which would show that this village must have been in existence. However, other archaeologists later resumed raised question about this finding. McRae also mentioned that there have been archaeological digs that uncovered first century tombs in the vicinity of Nazareth. Two tombs contained objects such as pottery lamps, glass vessels, and vases from the first, third, and fourth century. McRae picked up a copy of a book by archaeologist Jack Feingem, 
published by Princeton University Press. He leafed through it, then read Feingren's analysis from the tombs. It can be concluded that Nazareth was a strongly Jewish settlement in the Roman period. McRae looked up at me. There has been discussion about the location of some sites from the first century, such as exactly where Jesus' tomb is situated. But among the archaeologists there have never really been a big doubt about the location of Nazareth. The burden of proof ought to be on those who dispute its existence. That burden becomes, that burden became more difficult in the subsequent years after the discovery of two houses from first century Nazareth. In 2006, the Nazareth Archaeological Project began excavating beneath the Sisters of Nazareth Covenant, a location known since 1880. The director of the project, Ken Dark of the University of Reading, Reading, described the remains of the first century home that was found. Taken together, the walls conformed to the plan of a so-called country yard house. One of the typical ar architectural forms of early Roman period settlements in the Galilee, Dark said. Archaeologists found doors and windows cooking pottery and spindle wool used for spinning thread. Fragments of limestone vessels which Jews believed could not become impure were also found, suggesting the Jewish family lived there. The house must date from the first century AD or earlier, Dark concluded. Not no stratified pottery earlier or later than the early Roman period was discovered in layers associated with the house. Another first century house, similar in structure, was discovered nearby in an excavation by Yardanian Alexandri of the Israel Antiquities Authority in 2009. Such evidence would be consistent with what archaeologists of the Roman province elsewhere conveniently, conventionally term a small town. Dark said the evidence suggests that Jesus' boyhood was spent in a conservative Jewish community that had little contact with Hellenistic or Roman culture. Some people have wondered whether Dark's term may be accurately found the very house where Jesus grew up, while clues from later centuries suggest Byzantines may have believed that this was the house where Jesus spent his childhood. Dark concludes that it is impossible to say in archaeological on archaeological grounds. On the other hand, there is no good archaeological reason why such an indication should be discounted. Regardless, the case of the existence of Nazareth is the first century had gotten strong over the years. Puzzle 3. Slaughter of Bethlehem. Slaughter at Bethlehem. The Gospel of Matthew paints a crimson scene. Herod the Great, the king of Judah, feeling threatened by the birth of a baby whom he fe feared would eventually seize his throne, dispatched his troops to murder all children under the age of two in Bethlehem. Warned by an angel, however, Joseph escaped to Egypt with Mary and Jesus, and only after Herod dies do they return to settle in Nazareth 
and the entire episode having fulfilled three ancient prophecies about the Messiah. See Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. The problem, there is no independent confirmation that this mass murder ever took place. There's nothing in the writing of Josephus or other historians. There's no archaeological support. There is no record or doctrine or documents. Certainly an event of this magnitude would have been noticed by someone other than Matthew, I insisted. With the complete absence of the historical or archaeological collaboration, isn't it logical to conclude that this slaughter never occurred? I can't see why. I can see why you would say that, McRae replied, since today an event like that would probably be splashed all over CNN and the rest of the news media. I agree. In fact, in 1997 and 1998, there was a steady stream of news accounts about Muslim extremists repeatedly staging commando raids and slaying virtually entire villages, including women and children in Algeria. The entire world was taking notice. But when McRae but, added McRae, you have to put yourself back in the first century and keep few things in mind. First Bethlehem was probably no bigger than Nazareth. So how many babies of that age would there be in a village of 500 or 600 people? Not thousands or hundreds, although certainly a few. Second, Herod the Great was a bloodthirsty king. He killed members of his own family. He executed lots of people who he thought might challenge him. So the fact that he had killed some babies in Bethlehem was not going to captivate the attention of people in the Roman world. And third, there was no television, no radio, no newspaper. It would have taken a long time for word of this to get out, especially from such a major village especially from such a minor village way in the back hills of nowhere and historians had much bigger stories to write about. As a journalist, this is still hard to found. This just wasn't much of a story, I asked a bit incredulously. I don't think it was, at least not in these days, he said. Madmen killing everyone who seemed to be potentially threatened to him. That was business as usual for Herod. Later, of course, as Christianity developed, the incident became more important. But I would have been surprised if this had made a big splash back then. Maybe so, but this was difficult to imagine for a journalist who turned who trained, who was trained to sniff out news in a highly technology, technology, technological age of rapid and worldwide communication. At the same time, I had to acknowledge that from what I knew of the bloody landscape of ancient Palestine, McRae's explanation did not seem reasonable. This left one other area I wanted to inquire about, and to me it was the most fascinating of all. Riddle of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Admittedly, there is an allure to archaeology. Ancient tombs, cryptic inscriptions etched in stone or sketched into pipers, bits of broken pottery, worn coins, their tantalizing clues for an interest and in for that state in for veteran investigation. But few vestiges of the past have generated as much 
intrigue as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Hundreds of manuscripts dating from 250 BC to AD 68 that were found in caves 20 miles east of Jerusalem in 1947. They apparently had been hidden by a strict sect of Jews called the Essenians before the Romans destroyed their settlements. Some bizarre claims have been made about the scrolls, including John Marco Allegro's absurd book in which he theorized, theorized that Christians emerged from a fertile cult in which it hurt tripped out on hallucinate, hallucinogenic mushrooms. In a mere, in a more, in a more legitimate, but neither the less much questioned assertion, Piper ex expert Joe O'Callaghan said one Dead Sea fragment is part of the earliest manuscript found ever found in the Gospel of Mark dating back to the mere 17 to 20 years after Jesus was crucified. However, scholars continue to be skeptical of his interpretation. In any event, no inquiry about the archaeological of the first century would be complete without asking about the scrolls. Do they tell us anything directly about Jesus? I asked McRae. Well, no, Jesus isn't specifically mentioned in any of the scrolls, he replied. Primarily, these documents give us insights into Jewish life and customs. Then we, he pulled out some papers and pointed to an article that was published in late 1997. Although, he added, there is very interesting development involving the manuscript called 4Q521 that could tell us something about who Jesus was claiming to be. That whets my appetite. Tell me about it, I said with some urgency in my voice. McRae unfolded the mystery. The Gospel of Matthew describes how John the Baptist imprisoned and wrestling with lingering doubts about Jesus identified uh, Jesus identity sent his followers to ask Jesus this monetary question are you the one who is to come or should we be expecting someone else Matthew chapter 11 verse 3 he was seeking a straight answer about whether Jesus was the long awaited Messiah Though, through, I mean, through centuries, Christians have wondered about Jesus rather enigmatically and enigmatic answer. Instead of directly saying yes or no, Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. And the good news is being proclaimed to the poor. Matthew chapter 11 verses 4 to 5. Jesus' response was an allusion to Isaiah chapter 35. But for some reason, Jesus included the phrase, The dead are raised, which is conspicuously absent from the Old Testament text. This is where 4Q521 come in. This non-biblical manuscript from the Dead Sea collection, con written by in Hebrew, dates back to 30 years before Jesus was born, and contains versions of Isaiah chapter 61 that does include this missing phrase, "The dead are raised." Scroll scholar Craig Evans has pointed out that this phrase
phrase in 4Q521 is unquestionably embedded in a messianic context, McRae says. It refers to the wonders that the Messiah will do when he comes and when heaven and earth will obey him. So when Jesus gave his response to John, he was not being ambiguous at all. John would have instantly recognized his words as distinct claim that Jesus was the Messiah. McRae tossed me the article in which Evans was quoting as saying, 4Q521 makes it clear that Jesus' appeal to Isaiah 35 in, is indeed messianic. In essence, Jesus is telling John through his messengers that the messianic things are happening. So that answers John's question. Yes, he is the one who is to come. I sit back in my chair. To me, Evans' discovery was a remarkable confirmation of Jesus' self-identity. It was staggering to me. It was staggering to me how modern archaeology could finally unlock the significance of a statement on which Jesus boldly asserted nearly 2,000 years ago that he was indeed the anointed one of God. A remarkable, accurate source book. Archaeology repeated affirmation of the New Testament accurately provides important corroboration for its reliability. This is the stark this is in stark contrast with how archaeology has provided, has proved to be de devastating for Mormonism. Although John Smith, the founder of the Mormon Church, claims that his book, Mormon, is the most correct of any book upon the earth, Archaeology has repeatedly failed to substantiate its claims about events that supposedly occurred long ago in America. I remember writing to the Smithsonian Institute to inquire about whether there was any evidence supporting the claim of Mormonism, only to be told that it is that only to be told in equivocal terms that its archaeologicalists see no direct connection between the archaeology of the New World and the subject matter of this that book. As author John Ankerberg and John Weldon concluded in the book on the topic, in other words, no Book of Mormon sites have ever been located. No Book of Mormon person, place, nation, or name has ever been found. No Book of Mormon artifacts. No Book of Mormon scripture. No Book of Mormon inscriptions. Nothing which demonstrates the Book of Mormon is anything other than a myth or invention has ever been found. However, the story is totally different for the New Testament. McRae's conclusions have been echoed by many other scientists, including prominent Australian archaeologist Clifford Wilson, who wrote, Those who know the facts now recognize that the New Testament must be accepted by remarkable, accurate source books. With Craig Bloomberg, having established the essential reliability of the New Testament document, Bruce Metzger, having confirmed their accurate transmittal through history, Edwin Yomashi, having demonstrated extensive collaboration by ancient historians and others, and now John McRae, 
having shown how archaeology um, scores, underscores their trustworthiness, I had to agree with Wilson. The case for Christ, while far from complete, has, was being constructed on solid bedrock. At the same time, I knew there was I knew there were some high profile professors who would dissent from that assessment. You've seen them quoted in Newsweek and being interviewed on the evening news talking about their radical reassessment of Jesus. The time has come for me to confront their critics head on before I went any further in my investigation. The me that meant a trip to Minnesota to interview a bestie Yale-educated scholar named Dr. Greg Hoyt.